from the Digital Media Center on the campus of Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. This is Ramping Up Your English, an educational program for intermediate level English language learners. Here's your host for Ramping Up Your English, John Letts. Welcome to Ramping Up Your English, winner of the Southern Oregon Television Award for Program of the Year and the Award for Best Educational Program. I'm your host and the producer of the program, John Letts. Ramping Up Your English is an educational support program for intermediate English learners. It's a program for people from all language backgrounds. Ramping Up Your English is also for people of all ages. Now, if you've already passed the beginning stages of learning English, and want to reach higher levels of proficiency, this program is designed to meet your needs. We take a content-based approach to helping you reach higher levels of English proficiency. Our current thematic unit is Animals. This is segment one of episode 47. Let's go to the zoo. Those are welcome words to millions of people every year, 118 million in the United States alone. The word zoo is short for zoolo vo zoological park or zoological park. Sorry, I kind of got my Spanish pronunciation in there. Uh, while there's nothing like being there, we'll bring you some video of zoos. Now, we do some serious language work in this episode. We're going to model and review discussion skills, and you'll see how this ties into today's theme of zoos. I won't keep you waiting any longer. Here's a video clip with scenes from three zoos, a zoo in Portland, Oregon, one in Oakland, California, and the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. As I said before, let's go to the zoo. Elephants. Seems like every zoo has to have some. Well, the Oregon Zoo in Portland has had great success in breeding and caring for elephants. A zoo is the place to go if you want to see animals you'd never see in your backyard, including some you'd never want to see in your backyard. The zoo is a great place to bring a kid. There's no mistaking the excitement when a child encounters a living, breathing member of the animal kingdom. Some children get to help in a zoo's conservation mission due to the education outreach at most major zoos, like this zoo in Portland. I recall one of my visits to the Oregon Zoo and watching this polar bear from above the water and then below the water watching it swim. It's a sight I'll always remember. I especially value this picture I took at the zoo in Portland. This sea lion is obviously aware and curious of the children just outside this spacious tank, and the hand on the glass demonstrates the desire to interact. I got my best wolf pictures at the Oregon Zoo, including this one. I once saw a gray wolf when driving in Canada, but I could never have come away with a picture like this one. Zoos have monkeys and exotic animals like this one. It's a place where children make a connection that could grow into an ethic of stewardship and conservation. With very few but well-publicized exceptions, zoos provide a place of safety both for the animals that live there and for the people who come to see them. Most people can't afford to take their family to Africa but zoos give them a chance to see exotic animals like these hippopotamus. In fact, African animals are well represented in American zoos. As Africa struggles with habitat loss and poaching, American zoos provide a lifeboat for some of this fauna through their breeding programs, all the while giving people a chance to see these great animals. Zoos are kid-friendly places that families can enjoy and learn about nature at the same time. Oh, 
We did our afternoon run through the meadow. That was making noise. Okay, she's getting heavy. Here. Okay, look. Sam? It's an adventure for the kids, a place of dazzling spectacle, and a partner in saving endangered species. Oakland, California has a zoo, a very impressive one, far beyond my early experiences, my memories of zoos, where animals were confined to steel cages. The animals here live in areas that resemble their habitats in their own homelands. The gular sac under their chin acts like an amplifier to make them call the loudest sound in the jungle. Or in the zoo. Siamangs and white-handed gibbons are found in the same tropical rainforest in Southeast Asia. Within these areas, animals are free to move around and do many of the things they would do in nature. There are enclosures here, as in any zoo. In Oakland, volunteers set out food for the chimpanzees. They purposely put the food in different areas each day, making the chimps have to search for it. That doesn't seem to be a huge challenge for these intelligent primates, but this approach, known as enrichments, helps keep the chimpanzees active and healthy. Not all of the animals are beautiful or majestic. The warthog may not inspire awe, but it does attract attention. Zoos have breeding programs that serve as DNA banks for endangered species. Some of these have been successful enough to return some animals to the wild. A good example is the California condor, which was once on a one-way road to extinction. That could be the case for some populations of giraffes. Every zoo I visited in the United States has giraffes. <laughs> One of the joys of visiting a zoo is to hear the excitement of the people you also get to hear a variety of languages. A PBS program in 1987 looked at the connection between people and animals. ...in a man-made landscape thousands of miles from their ancestral homes. Today, there are more than five billion people on Earth. Never have we humans exercised such dominion over nature, nor been so removed from it. And yet we still wonder at living things. We know we are part of nature. Our animal past flows through our minds and bodies. And so, living in cities, we make zoos. And in searching for connections to wild creatures, we cage them. That was nice. Good boy, Herc. It seems the more urbanized we've become, the more we long for some remembered or imagined contact with wild animals. Each year, more people in the United States visit zoos than attend the arenas and stadiums of all the major professional sports teams combined. All of us feel a profound need to connect. Hello? Try out Hoots. Hoots. Say something, bird. It moves its head when I do that, John. 
she's watching you. That last scene was of my little brother Eddie and me back in 1987. That was at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. With that cameo appearance from the past, we reach the end of segment one. We'll return with segment two right after this. Organization that's doing big time restoration of forests and stream banks. Hello, I'm John Letts, producer of Adventures in Education. Welcome back to Ramping Up Your English. We're using a content-based approach to help intermediate-level English learners reach higher levels of English proficiency. Our thematic unit is animals, and today our focus is on zoos and on discussion skills. I have another video on zoos to share, but first I want to talk about discussion skills. I have to admit that it seems like discussions, like I used to have with people in the past, are a dead art in the United States. I can remember sharing my viewpoint and listening to the viewpoint of someone else in a way that left both of us enriched by the experience. These were very natural exchanges of ideas and viewpoints. While I never thought a lot about being respectful, in hindsight we were respectful of each other. Furthermore, a discussion didn't start as a means of forcing people to my viewpoint. Contrast that to what happens so often today. Viewpoints that are different are usually dismissed as wrong, and the person who has those different viewpoints is treated like they must be weak-minded or even evil. That's what we call demonizing the person. Well, no one's enriched by such exchanges, and many are bullied into keeping their opinion to themselves. Voices are raised, speakers are interrupted, and anger is often the result. That's not the kind of discussion we'll be practicing today. Think of the discussion as a kind of informal debate. We'll be exchanging ideas and viewpoints based on an objective set of facts. We'll learn and practice the language that goes along with offering opinions in a respectful manner in this episode and the next one. That respectful discussion will involve the theme of zoos. The objective facts will come from an article from the Wikipedia on zoos. There are more academic sources for objective facts, but we're trying to keep things simple and focused on the language. Now this book has lots of information about zoos and some great pictures of animals that are featured there. It's entitled American Zoos from Mallard Press. Photographs are by Alan Beer and text by Stephen Dale. Eighteen zoos are featured here. The National Zoo and the St. Louis Zoo are two that I visited. It also includes the Dallas View, the, the Dallas Zoo, I should say. Well, I've never been there, but my cousin Luke visited with his video camera. Now, because his camera had a barely charged battery, Luke had the challenge of covering as much of that huge zoo as possible in very little time. Here's the video about his visit using the footage he captured on his latest visit. Cousin Luke's mad dash through the Dallas Zoo starts with the penguins. These are penguins from the south coast of Africa. Here's a colorful ape, a mandrill. The enclosure goes deep, providing space for these animals to move around and feel a bit like they're at home. Zoos have to balance the needs of the animals with the desire of visitors to see them. This long distance view may be all you get as a zoo visitor, but then there's the close and personal. What's neat about this shot is the girl and others approaching the enclosure when she hears all the excitement. The Dallas Zoo has an extensive gorilla program with one group that's a family group and the other that's a group of bachelors. 
You wouldn't know it from this big guy, but the gorilla enclosure has an extensive amount of space for these groups to move around in. Long night. <laughs> Education is part of the zoo's mission. After reading about this impressive crane, seeing it enriches the experience at the zoo. The hot Texas summers are probably just fine for the Nile crocodile here. While few people feel a close kinship with crocodiles, watching apes is not that different from seeing ourselves. It's not surprising then that we share a large percentage of our DNA. The Dallas Zoo is a great place to watch live animals and to ask questions what about is, them. The Dallas Zoo, like many zoos in North America, has an aviary where visitors can see birds. Looking up at the rocks, Visitors see a clip springer greatly resembling a mountain goat. The Dallas Zoo is the largest zoo in Texas. It's also the oldest. A great number of improvements have taken place since those early days back in the 1800s. The Dallas Zoo is accredited, meaning that it meets standards for quality of life for its animals and the safety of the visitors. The Dallas Zoo is involved in research as well as conservation efforts. It's part of a movement to save endangered animals and provide a place of safety and a chance to reproduce for those animals. Bringing color to the zoo, these lesser flamingos live here. Yes, they are very pink. They have no trouble sharing this space with ducks like this mallard drake. And what zoo would be complete without elephants? We'll do what the visitors to the Dallas Zoo do, watch the animals. I want to welcome Miss Lisa to our program. Lisa, welcome to Ramping Up Your English. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. Miss Lisa is going to help us model, do a role play of discussion skills. And we'll just jump right in. So I'll just say, well, we're friends, okay? So, uh, so Miss Lisa, what you got going today? I have a great day planned that's going to be big. I'm going to take my grandson to the Oregon Zoo. Oh. Yeah, I can't wait to see how he interacts and gets to see the animals. What are you doing this afternoon? Well, I'm not doing that. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. Pat but, you. <laughs> well, you know, uh, the thing is, I'm starting to really, I have my doubts. Oh. To me, it seems that, well, I just don't think zoos are good for the animals there. Oh, right, right. Well, I remember some zoos in the past that weren't too too kind to the animals, but I know that they've done a lot since then, with like 
you know, made them bigger places and like they've gotten some professionals in and they're doing some great things at the zoo. Yeah, there's no know? doubt about that. They have yeah. really made a lot of positive changes. Yeah. It's just that when you get down to the bottom of it, it's still an enclosure and it's still not really seeing the animals as they are in their natural life. True, true. I agree. But where else are your kids who can't travel going to be able to go and see these real animals up close? And you know what? They've come a long way. They've got like educational features next to each of the exhibits or areas that they have these, these animals in. So a lot could be learned, you know, for these young minds. I think that's a positive. Yeah, well, I mean, learning is important. Yeah. Uh, it's just that I know that when you see an animal in the wild, it's not just walk up and there they are, True. you know. And okay. so um, yeah, it's just my own doubts that I'm starting to have. I've been to zoos before and enjoyed it, but I'm, I'm just kind of not a little cold, cold, cool to the idea. Right, right. I see that a lot of animals, you know, are they're not in their natural habitats. But I know that nowadays zoos have, like, brought lots of land and property, so they've really tried to model a lot of their, the areas for the animals that mimic their natural, you know, environments and habitats. I, I know it's not the same, but I feel like they've, they're, they're doing some, some good effort. Well, they, the, the, no doubt they get an A for effort, <laughs> you know, or E for effort. The, the thing is, um, with, the, with the enclosures, is that it doesn't meet the needs of animals like elephants, for example. You know, elephants roam several miles a day. Well, mm. that, no, no matter how much space they give them at a zoo, they're not going to be able to do that. And then I look at zebras, you know, migratory animals. So many zoos have zebras. Well, zebras do these great, you know, 200, 300 mile migrations oh, on the Serengeti. Well, they're not going to do that at a zoo. That's true. That is true. That's true. I, uh, I feel for them. <laughs> You're making me think. But I do know also that the benefit is, is that a lot of these animals that are out there in the wild, they're being hunted, you know, and a lot of them are going extinct. So I think the zoos, you know, they're, they're giving them a safe place and refuge and like healing them and rehabilitating them. And then they've also brought biologists in. So they're trying to, you know, work with the endangered species to work with them, getting them off the endangered species list. Well, you know, they live longer. I mean, we know that from, from, right. from facts in, in yeah. captivity. It's just that what is their life? You know, what, what's the quality of life in there as a, as a natural animal? So, uh, you know, I just, uh, I used to really enjoy zoos, but I've learned some things, you know, uh, fairly recently. And I'm really starting to, to question whether zoos are that good of an idea. Even the ones they, they save, you know, through reproduction and stuff, yeah. well, those usually cannot be left out, let out in the wild. That's true. Know, so. That's true. Yeah, what do you do with them, right? After they're, they've been in rehabilitated, you can't let them out. And what are they going to do? Are they, can they live back out in the wild? That's right. Wow, well, I don't know. That's, uh, that's something to think about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope if you change your mind, I appreciate it. If you want to come out, you know. Okay, well, I appreciate that. And, yeah. and by the way, have a good time. I mean, these are just my own doubts. Yeah. There's no reason you shouldn't have a great time with your grandson. Yeah, I was debating. You're making me think, like, hmm, should I take him? But I still think it might be a good experience. Then I can talk to him about those things, you know, like the good and bad aspects of Zoo and see what his take is on it. Okay, so what we've had here is a real brief discussion about this. And uh, I just want to... Ch uh, check in on some of the the parts of being respectful. Uh, did you feel I was respectful as the devil's advocate here? Definitely, oh, definitely. You didn't make me feel threatened, like you had the right or and I was wrong. I, I appreciate that. You know. Yeah. So this is a good example of a discussion that is respectful and enriching because we both learned things. So thank you, Miss Lisa, for being my guest oh, today. Thank you very much for having me on the show. So it, it's just a good idea. Now, you can watch Miss Lisa and me on a new children's program called Southern Oregon Classic Kids Show coming soon to RVTV Voices. Now, I hope you get the main idea of what a discussion that's respectful looks and sounds like. There are some specific words that help the process along, and I'll share some of those discussion skills in episode 48. Right now, I have some thoughts to share about discussion skills. Now, I can remember having a discussion like this and changing my mind about some things. Now, while I seldom had the change of mind during a discussion, 
I sometimes change my mind later while thinking about something someone else said. Also, if they brought up a fact that I was unsure of, I would later look up that fact for myself and see how valid it was. Notice that in the discussion that preceded, I put in the effort to make Miss Lisa feel good about her plans, although I didn't agree with her views. I expressed approval in wishing her a great time at the zoo. She did the same by holding open the invitation for me to join her if I changed my mind. We walked away as friends, and both were enriched by the discussion. Now, we may have learned something new, or we may have examined our own viewpoints and even felt validated in them. The important thing is we didn't tear each other down. We leave looking forward to our next discussion. If you're already living in the United States, you know that open, respectful discussions are rare nowadays. It's normal to see things differently from other people, but as President Obama urged, we especially need to listen to and engage with people who hold opposing viewpoints to our own. Perhaps, just perhaps, our being respectful and really listening will inspire others to do the same. Now, if you live outside the United States, you may have trouble understanding what our society has come to, and you may well bring a more open and respectful set of discourse rules with you. My hope is that through your influence, we can return to the interchange of ideas and viewpoints that leave people enriched by the discussions they've had with others. Now, if this had been a formal debate, using Wikipedia as a source would have gotten us laughed off the stage. I'm not recommending them as a solid source of facts. However, Wikipedia has evolved greatly since its beginnings, and it's very open about when it is lacking documentation when that occurs. Today, we use Wikipedia for its easy access, open to all, and its lack of bias. I don't see any agenda there except sharing information. In my role in this discussion about being against zoos, I used the points brought up by a section of the article that listed concerns about zoos. I used those to argue the position of con or against for the sake of the discussion. Presenting a different perspective than your own is called playing the devil's advocate. In reality, I'm pretty pro on zoos, and if you invite me, I'll gladly go to the zoo. Now, if you want to see the Wikipedia article from which we built our discussion, you'll find it on a link on my website. Go to letscreate.org and choose the episode 47 page, Zoos and Discussion Skills. You'll find the link on that page. I want to thank PBS and the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. for including my little brother and me in their program back in 1987. I also want to thank the Oakland Zoo and the Dallas Zoo. Special thanks to my cousin Luke for his video footage that he took at the Dallas Zoo. I want to thank my director, Denise Ross, the RVTV staff, and my talented and loyal crew, and I want to thank you, our viewers. All of you helped make this program an award winner. Join us next time for Ramping Up Your English. I'm John Letts. You've been watching Ramping Up Your English, a support program for intermediate level English language learners. Learn more. Visit our website at letscreate.org. You can also watch or download today's program at archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. Join us next time on RVTV Voices for Ramping Up Your English.